at 11.59 p.m. on Wednesday, March the 25th, 2020. The entire country of New Zealand, five million of us, went into lockdown to stop the spread of COVID-19. Over the past few weeks, the world has changed and it has changed very quickly. While we were in level four lockdown, I was given special permission to document what was happening to our country and interview the decision makers as events unfolded. I wish this wasn't happening, but it is. I think in a decision like that, your primary driver has to be science. I find out how we got here. I just felt that every day counted. I can remember pacing around the room, quite agitated. I just had the sense, let's push the button now, let's get ready. I meet Kiwis directly affected by the virus. The bride and groom at the center of one of New Zealand's largest clusters tell their story for the first time. I see firsthand just how dangerous this coronavirus is. It took me straight away to I see him. And I get a close up look at the enemy as New Zealand searches for a cure. With the world ravaged by COVID-19 and New Zealand in self-isolation at constant risk of new outbreaks, what do we do now? It all begins in Wuhan when people start getting sick from a mysterious illness. And at the end of December, the World Health Organization is told about a pneumonia-like illness. Chinese scientists identify that it is caused by a new type of coronavirus. Coronavirus is the name for a family of viruses. Most of them are like the common cold, but there are serious ones like SARS and MERS. They circulate in wild animals, but we still don't know much about this one. Scientists soon discover that the virus is now spreading through human to human transmission, and the virus finally gets a name. COVID. 19. Two weeks later, COVID-19 lands in New Zealand. We have testing underway on a suspected case. Patrick Gower is in the US and Patrick, the virus is spreading. Yes, tens of thousands of suspected cases across the states right now. It's really working out and a lot of good things are going to happen. We have rung the alarm bell loud and clear. The Director General of Health, Dr. Ashley Bloomfield, recommends stepping up New Zealand's response as other countries around the world try to get on top of the spread. Be strong, be kind. You must stay at home. Brace, brace, brace for level four. This is a COVID-19 announcement. New Zealand is moving to alert level four at 11.59 p.m. tonight. Level four changes our way of living overnight. Stay at home isn't just a message. Hello, hey, mate. Yeah. COVID-19 movement checkpoint. What is the purpose of your journey today? Uh, working as a journalist, um, essential essential worker, essential worker. Okay. Well, I'll let you through, take care and stay safe. Yeah, how you been finding all this? It's pretty weird. Oh, very, very weird times. <laughs> to say the least. COVID-19 testing stations are popping up around the country. Cheers, boys. I'm missing fast food, but all this drive through offers is a six inch swab. Can be a little bit unpleasant. Okay, so you'll feel me twisting it slightly. Oh. <laughs> and it's all done. Oh, that wasn't good. But no. it's not bad, is it? No. Made my eyes water. A day later, my results come back negative. The prospect of waves and waves of positive cases had put the country's emergency services on edge. It could have been so much different if we turned out like Italy, like America or something like that. Everyone is, is so grateful that we're, we're not in that situation. <laughs> New Zealand under level four is surreal. Everything feels different. It's just crazy with no one on the motorway. So sort of like hard to really get your head around. The incident involves a patient who experiences regular seizures. COVID could be present, so protection is worn, not just for the responders, but also for the families who are scared ambulance staff could be the ones carrying the virus. 
you were genuinely worried about your bubble yeah, getting burst yeah. today. We've been hoping this wouldn't happen. We now have a new vocabulary. Alert levels, community transmission, PPE, contact tracing, social distancing, and we live in bubbles. But one month earlier, we have no idea that it would come to this. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern introduces the country to the levels. We immediately move to level two. I know this current situation is causing huge disruption and uncertainty. And right now, I cannot tell you when that will end. Please be strong, be kind, and unite against COVID-19. On the very same day the Prime Minister addresses the nation, a wedding takes place at the bottom of the world. It is one of over 450 weddings in New Zealand that weekend. With gatherings under 100 allowed, around 70 people attend the reception in Bluff. The wedding will go on to become the source of one of the biggest COVID clusters in the country, infecting 98 people and taking two lives, including the groom's father. For the first time, the bride and groom, Betty and Manoli, are ready to talk about their experience. Hey, kia ora, Betty. Yeah, nice to meet you. you yeah, yeah, thank Come you for on. having me. Yep. Yeah. This is Manoli. Manoli. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. How are you, mate? Good, yeah, good, thanks. Yeah. Uh, well, um, here we are. Yeah. Before COVID took over their lives, Betty and Manoli had spent months planning their wedding. Betty had proposed to Manoli on a Stewart Island hunting trip. It's just after the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> next photo, next photo, next photo. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> wow. Mm. Good photographer. <laughs> Manoli's father, originally from Greece, had lived in Wellington for over 50 years, where he'd worked on the walls and owned a fish and chip shop. So that's your dad, Manoli. What was his name? Christos. Yeah, you guys were very close. tight. Yep, we were best friends, yep. Very, yeah, very close. Christos was 87. He planned to return home to Greece to live after the wedding. So what's everyone doing here? So we wanted to have a photo down by the sign there. So we all wandered down. That was a great photo. Mm. Group wedding photo under the bluff sign. Yeah. Yep. yep. Oh. oh, the tradition. <laughs> yeah, she's got to stand on my foot. Th is that a, an actual thing? A Greek tradition, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a Greek and Maori mm -hmm. wedding. It yes, was, yeah. that's Greek. Oh, here we go. That's the, the end of the night dance. Yeah. This is the day that you were after, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What we're yeah. looking at here. Yes. Awesome. Eight days before the wedding, Director General of Health Ashley Bloomfield can see the pandemic is getting worse. It was actually in Invercargill of all places. Uh, my son's a bagpiper. I love it. I'd gone down there for the Pipe Band National Championships. And that's probably one of the last mass gatherings there were. In. And I'd left my decision so late to go down there that the only place I could stay was actually a backpacker's. Just read quite a seminal, you know, paper that really pulled it together and showed what was happening in some countries. And I can remember pacing around the room, quite agitated. I just had this sense, let's, let's push the button now, let's get ready. The next day, the government announces everyone arriving in the country must self-isolate for 14 days. And the Prime Minister confirms the country's approach to battling the virus. The goal is to ultimately flatten the curve which means avoiding an overwhelming peak of cases. But is it the right plan? Did you ever get just worried about New Zealand? Yeah, I did. And I was worried because what we were seeing overseas was this triple whammy. First of all, the health impact and the deaths if it got out of control. The second was this huge impact on the healthcare system. But the third thing was, you know, just the impact on uh, the social and economic well-being of the country. Are you sort of like in a sort of, oh, shit, this could be bad sort of mood? Or are you more sort of, this is the process kind of guy? Steve Hansen uh, famously said, worries are wasted emotion. Well, I must have been wasting some emotion because I was worried. There were signs that it was going to be kind of a big one. 
and there were moments when you think, gosh, uh, I, I wish this wasn't happening, but it is. With New Zealand in lockdown, like the rest of the country, Betty and Manoli stay at home, happily married for five eventful days. Happy times, great times. Having an amazing day, all our family around us, and then it all changed. When did you start realising that COVID-19 had been around? Um, Thursday. Thursday, mm. yeah. Mm. Um, one of the guests rang me to say, just ask how we were. Um, how are you feeling? I said, oh, well, no, we're all right. Um, we're all good. And then he said that he was unwell and had been tested for COVID and was positive. Mm. Then it was like, well, hmm. You had COVID-19 yourselves. I think it was Sunday we got the test results back. Mm. Um, it said that we were both positive. Mm. Just felt like a normal flu. Yeah. But with me, it was real positive. Way worse than the flu. Mm. <laughs> Something that I've never had and felt in my life. Mm. You know, was I going to mm. get, get right? Was I going to get out of it? Mm. Four days into lockdown, New Zealand has its first COVID-related death. Invercargill ramps up testing. It's literally at the bottom of the world here. Could you believe that COVID-19 was breaking out here all over the show? No, I must admit, when it first happened, I thought, oh, well, we'll be right down here, we're okay. And then all of a sudden, we've had the highest numbers in the country. So going from thinking you were at the bottom of the world, we'll be all right, to being in the thick of it was quite interesting. Did it feel on some days that maybe it was going to get out of control? Yeah, yeah. Were you worried? I think we worked so hard initially to get this up and running that we didn't have time to worry initially. <laughs> I'm not crying. <laughs> um, I do remember I went home one day and I went for a run and I couldn't run because I was crying. <laughs> Going, oh my goodness, what's happening? What's happening to your community? What's yeah, the world. Here? What's happening to the world, really? What's going on? What potentially could happen to New Zealand? Seeing what was happening in other parts of the world, like Italy at the time, and going, crikey, what would happen if it really came here? What would happen to our health system, I guess? Before the lockdown, in the middle of March, COVID-19 is spreading rapidly around the globe. But in New Zealand, case numbers are two weeks behind most of the world. We have an advantage, but we need to act fast. The sort of the approach was that if it's two weeks' time we need to do it, let's, let's do it now. And things ramp up. New Zealand is currently at alert level two. But the plans change quickly. The original intention we, when we went into alert level two was to stay there for some time. Very rapidly, it became apparent just in the space of a few days, we realised actually we needed to move much more rapidly. At that point, our cases were starting to increase and you could see that the trajectory, if you didn't act really quickly, was that exponential growth. The lockdown's job was to stop that exponential growth. Every day we waited for the case numbers to see if the lockdown was working. If we were the UK, at this point, our equivalent would be two and a half thousand deaths and no end in sight. Based on those numbers, New Zealand would now have more than 3,000 dead. But in March, at the start of lockdown, the number of COVID cases continue to rise. Back in Wellington, Manoli's dad starts to get symptoms. And um, the next day, Thursday morning, he was uh, very, very sick. Mm -hmm. And um, he got rushed to hospital. He, he was going up and down. Mm. And then he started getting deteriorating. Yeah. You did talk to him? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But he couldn't say much. Mm. The doctors wanted him to have the oxygen. oxygen. Mm. Through, his, um, through his nose. Because he was um, pulling that out. Because he's in so much pain. Mm. I just tried to tell him to be strong. Mm. Mm -hmm. And we'll get through it. You said that in Greek? Mm. Yeah. Mm. 
That's the last thing you said to him. Yep. Mm. Next couple of days after that, he passed away. Yeah. Mm. He lived a great life and. So what does the bluff cluster mean to you? For me, it just felt like it could have been anyone. Indeed, yeah. These are all people, these are all Kiwis, and, you know, I have a sense that many New Zealanders also felt that as well, and that's yeah. why they wanted to do their bit to ensure that it didn't continue to grow and that we didn't see more and more of this. New Zealand has 17 significant clusters, the bluff cluster being one of the largest. Dr. Gemma Geegan is a genome expert and is now able to genetically trace where many of those clusters originated. Just about every time a virus spreads to a different person, it might mutate slightly. You know, it did start in Wuhan in China, but quickly escaped um, and, and spread around the world. And when it's spreading and when it's mutating at the same time, it forms different versions of itself. And so we can track where these versions came from. You can see lots of connecting lines coming into New Zealand, which means Basically, the virus came from all over. We can see here that there's a family tree of, of all New Zealand's cases highlighted in green. And this top cluster actually represents all the samples from Bluff. Where did the Bluff cluster come from? The closest genetic relative of the virus that began that Bluff cluster was likely from New York. The Bluff cluster came from New York City? Most likely, yeah. Contact tracing establishes that the virus is brought into New Zealand by a flight attendant. The flight attendant, from what I understand, was on a flight from LA to New Zealand. And so it's probably likely that someone from New York boarded a flight to LA and perhaps even got on that flight from LA to New Zealand while infecting the flight attendant and perhaps more people. The flight attendant is a very close family friend of Manoli and Betty and had no symptoms before the wedding. This is brought in by someone you know well who's coming from overseas. What are your feelings there? Because everyone will be wondering this. Not putting the blame on no one. Mm -hmm. no. You blame the virus. Mm. Yep. You want to have the day back, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. I don't want to look back on that day. Mm, not everything else that happened after. On the day we talked, COVID cases around the world are approaching 8 million. It's such a complicated picture when you build it up. You know, this is a global pandemic. It's, it's bigger than just a wedding. Diseases have an R naught value. The bigger the number, the more infectious it is. This virus is incredibly contagious. If there wasn't any interventions, it's got an R naught of around three to four estimated. So that means that one person on average infects three to four people, and then they go on to infect around three and four people. So this is an exponential spread. And so it is incredibly contagious. When Adrian set off to bike the length of the country in February, there were no cases of COVID-19 in New Zealand. It wasn't even labelled a pandemic. Where'd you start? Oh, there we go. So uh, that's right at the top at Cape Ranga, <laughs> the, the, the destination there. Almost a month later, Adrian had pushed through to her final destination, the bluff sign. To finally make it. Yeah, it was awesome. At the same time, Betty, Manoli and the wedding party arrived for photos. And then a coach turned up and outpiled all these people and like, oh, what's going on? And I, I didn't talk to the, the bride and groom, but we're definitely interacting with some of the wedding party. There was a lot of interest in our bikes. Some of them took photos for us and we were taking photos of them. They would take photos of my camera, then I'd take it back and I was eating at the same time. So there was just a, a lot going on. Adrian flies back to Auckland the same day that the Prime Minister announces New Zealand is heading into lockdown. I really struggled that week. I got to the kind of the Wednesday-ish and I like couldn't get out of bed. <laughs> and then that following weekend, there started kind of in the media, there were stories about this bluff wedding cluster. And I was like, oh, okay. I wonder if this is a little bit more going on than just feeling tired from <laughs> riding my bike. So that's when I went and got tested and then uh, later that week got the positive result back and 
Yeah, got coronavirus. <laughs> Can you believe that you caught coronavirus at the bottom of the world at the end of it? Of a... all the places. <laughs> Adrian infects four family members in her bubble. Without the lockdown, it would have spread to her co-workers and their families, and the bluff cluster would have been even more devastating. It's it's incredible, really, that they went to the bluff sign and caught it off the bluff cluster. It just highlights how contagious and how infectious this virus is, really. And so without, you know, an alert level for lockdown, this virus would have infected thousands of people in New Zealand. But a lockdown wasn't originally part of our plan. Everyone looked at me blankly, not quite like I was a complete idiot, but a bit of an idiot. In 2019, New Zealand was ranked 35th in its preparedness for a pandemic. The United States was rated number one in readiness. You can be as prepared as you like, but it's how you respond and how you behave when the situation actually arises that is the biggest determinant of success or failure. And as the pandemic intensifies, a number of strong voices help focus our response. Paddy Gow speaking. Follow the Putakawa. Professor Michael Baker is an academic with expertise in infectious diseases. He doesn't work for the government, but this was his field. He needed to get involved. Michael. Good evening. Yeah, hey. sorry to disturb your dinner. Yeah, yep. You're the first person I've actually visited under lockdown. Right. Yeah, so, so this, is, this is strange. Yeah, yeah, but can I, can I come in? Yeah. Yeah. Michael knew a pandemic was well overdue. 102 years earlier, the influenza virus known as the Spanish flu set a frightening precedent. A third of the world became infected. Nothing can totally prepare us for an event like 1918 or another virus that might be just as bad or worse. Michael tried to get us to pay attention by getting 440 kids at his son's school to play dead, showing how many Kiwis died on just one day at the peak of the 1918 pandemic. 100 years later, Michael promoted a solution if we faced a deadly virus again. New Zealand is one of the few countries that, that actually could potentially shut its borders if we were confronted by a very severe pandemic disease. And just two years later, COVID-19 arrives here. Now is the time to say this is a pandemic and it is going to affect every country on Earth at some point. Now is the time for maximum containment effort in New Zealand. COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. If we want to move fast, get ahead of the virus, we should be moving right up to level four uh, as soon as possible. And effectively, this is the shutdown approach. Some people look at it initially and probably thought that you were a bit crazy. So I like people to agree with me when I say things. And I went to meetings and everyone looked at me blankly, not quite like I was a complete idiot, but a bit of an idiot. They said, why would we do that? And of course you say, well, actually, I'm not absolutely certain myself. You know, you're taking a position which you think is logical, but there isn't an evidence base to draw on. There was this point where you didn't know which way it was going to go. How are you feeling at that point? I, I felt... I felt dreadful it's because I wasn't sure. And you get the self-doubt. I felt just so uncomfortable, almost quite sickened, actually. People were doubting you or people weren't going to go with the lockdown. I mean, what was it? Just that um, I couldn't make the case strongly enough. But you couldn't persuade people to do it? Yeah. Why did that sicken you so much? I just felt that every day counted um, and that we would basically lose the battle. So that was what was sickening you, that New Zealand was going to lose the fight against COVID-19? I mean, this was the most frightening pandemic I've seen in my working life. What was the feeling for you when it did happen? Well, yeah, it felt, I'm feeling like that now. We embraced each other in our department and um, just felt hugely relieved. Michael might be out on his own arguing for elimination rather than flattening the curve, but he isn't the only person worried about committing to a nationwide lockdown. Uh, yeah, you have moments of self-doubt. You think, you know, OK, uh, is this the right call? You know, locking down the country with 
the best evidence you had, but you're still locking down the country with incomplete evidence. In some ways, it's a gamble. It is a gamble, you're right. However, we could see what the alternative was. There are two types of gambles. They're the ones where you cross your fingers and throw the dice, and then there's the calculated gamble. And it seemed to us really clear. You either uh, went into lockdown early and avoided a catastrophe, really, or the catastrophe was upon you, and you still had to go into lockdown. And it is starting to work. 12 days after lockdown, the virus peaks and starts coming down. We are doing so well, the talk moves from containment to elimination. We could allow a wave of devastation to hit us like it has in other countries, or we could take decisive preemptive action by going hard and early into lockdown to stop the spread of the disease in its tracks. The 1 p.m. daily briefing becomes appointment viewing across the country as the nation rallies behind the elimination goal. The next morning, I joined the Prime Minister on her way to work. Hi, Prime Minister. Working from home. <laughs> it's like everyone is. What happened as we went from flattening the curve to elimination? I knew that I wanted our health system to cope, that you want to do everything you can to save lives, and that you remember early on, the big movement was flatten the curve. And so we modelled flattening the curve and what it looked like for New Zealand and it was still devastating. No health system is built to cope with a pandemic like this. We needed to do more. Yeah. And that's when we started modelling what that would look like. And it, it really brought us to the strategy we're in. Um, we can see it here. Yeah. I mean, what do you think of that? Is it freaky or what? The first day uh, into lockdown, I stepped out and I just thought it was surreal. Like nothing I'd ever expect I'd ever see. When you've got to make a decision like the lockdown and you don't know all the stuff that you need to know, basically, was there gut instinct in there as well? I think in a decision like that, your primary driver has to be science. And it has been. One of the arguments that has been made against what we're doing has been the impact on the economy. Then I look at countries who thought, no, we'll stay open, we'll operate for that same argument. They've ended up in lockdown regardless and yeah. they've ended up there longer. You know, by going hard and going early, it wasn't so that we would be there for a long time, it would be so we could be there for the shortest time possible. And so big sacrifice up front that hopefully pays off. But is the sacrifice going to be too big? The numbers are just astronomical. You know, we've spent $10,000 million in just over three weeks. We're in the throes of responding to the biggest pandemic there has been in over 100 years. This one is a huge event. It's been described as the most significant global event since World War II. In the lockdown, it is considered a heroic duty to stay at home to protect our old and vulnerable. But there is also a new hero keeping the country running, the essential worker. Everyone was scared, you know? And I had a friend, you know, call me and say, you know, you guys are doing an awesome job. And I thought, what, what the heck? You know, I've done this for 20 years. I never got praise like that, but then another person said it, another person, he said to us, oh, yeah, shit, we're, we're doing something here, and it's, it's really good, yeah. While supermarkets might be having record sales, many businesses are closed, and the lockdown sees 35,000 Kiwis lose their jobs. This is a once-in-a-century shock to our economy and to our society. Demand for food parcels skyrocket as many are struggling to survive the government steps in to stop an economic collapse. You made just huge calls as a finance minister, yeah. up with all of the big calls that finance ministers have made in New Zealand history. The numbers are just astronomical. You know, we've spent the best part of $10 billion on the wage subsidy scheme, $10,000 million in just over three weeks. If you want to put that in some kind of context, that's pretty much as much new spending as I was going to be able to authorise through the whole term of government in three weeks. But we're also losing two and a half billion dollars of activity a week out of the economy. Lockdown is unaffordable. During lockdown, I drive south to Queenstown as there are no flights. Without tourism, it's nearly empty and hotels are cheap. But it turns out there are still tourists in town. 
How have you guys been enjoying lockdown in New Zealand? We couldn't be in a better place. We couldn't be in a better place. Uh, <laughs> all of our friends, we communicate to our friends, and every one of them to a person says, stay where you are over there. It's so much better than in the States. Last year, New Zealand had 4 million international visitors, but with borders closed and stay-at-home orders in place, Queenstown is dead. Tourism's like farming, and so you expect up and downs. I'd have to admit, we didn't quite expect the scenario where there would be a 100% collapse of business. Big business is hit hard too. Greg Foran, the former CEO of Walmart, whose sales are currently soaring, just started a new job at Air New Zealand. My uh, first official day happened to be the day after we pulled the first flight out of Shanghai. But effectively, it feels like we've been in crisis mm -hmm. since the very first day I started. Within a week, our world changed. Effectively, your revenue goes from six billion to nothing. You know, it's an organisation that, it's something I've never experienced before, that just stops. 4,000 people have lost their jobs at Air New Zealand so far. Despite the economic carnage, business leaders like the Mowbray family, who run global toy company Zuru, support the lockdown. Being based in Asia creates huge advantages for us. We currently employ more than 5,000 people. Hi, Anna. Isn't it so sure. odd, this where I can't actually shake your hand. That's bizarre. We have to keep this distance, yep. Well, so, yeah. Space around here. At the beginning of the year, Anna was at the Zuru offices in China as the virus started spreading out of Wuhan. Really being at the forefront of that allowed me to understand if we let that pandemic take hold, how devastating this could be for New Zealand. The Mowbray's main concern is for the health of the country, but for them, the lockdown also makes economic sense. If you go early, does that mean we're going to come out of early and we're going to be in a far better position economically on the other side? If we go late, yeah, we get the economic benefits up to that period of going late, but the opportunity costs and the flip side of that economically down the track is going to be far worse. As New Zealand moves up to level two for the first time, the business community isn't happy. We were all talking saying we need to step up the pressure somehow on this government to take more action. An emergency conference call between the PM, the finance minister, epidemiologist Michael Baker, and business leaders Graham Hart, Craig Heatley, Stephen Tindall, Sam Morgan, Rob Fife, and Nick is made. They are all pushing for a lockdown. She prefaced the call by saying, hey, look, we actually are looking to escalate the levels very quickly. I feel like as we put more pressure on, I think the government and credit to them started to listen. The next day, the Prime Minister announces we are heading into a four-week nationwide Level 4 lockdown. Our plan is simple. We can stop the spread by staying at home and reducing contact. In America, at a time when some parts of the US are shutting down, the President had a different message. Our country wasn't built to be shut down. America will again and soon be open for business. We cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself. We're not going to let the cure be worse than the problem. Yes, we would take a hit, and we are taking a hit. But it seemed to us clear that, in this instance, doing the right thing for health and for the health system was also the right thing to do for the economy. But we still need to find a way out. Having a vaccine is the holy grail, of course. That's what everybody wants. In early March, we are worried about the pandemic overwhelming our healthcare system. We don't have enough ventilators and intensive care won't cope with the numbers projected. We've been winding down the public health side of the health system for 20 years. The ministry has shrunk to a very small organisation. There was not the capacity around the country. We were doing very little testing, so we had to do something, and that meant the lockdown. As well as slowing the virus, the Level 4 lockdown bought us time to get more tests, more PPE, more hospital beds, and better contact tracing and procedures to deal with a brand new virus. But for some, COVID would still be a fight for their life. Tofinger works at the Auckland airport protecting the border and has been married to Lillian for 35 years. 
they are two of the more than 1,500 people in New Zealand who become ill. When did you realise that you had caught COVID-19? It was the first. Yes, I got it first. On the 23rd of March, Tofinger starts to feel ill. By the time he tests positive, he's feeling better. But now Lillian has become very ill. My body was getting like really weak and started to vomit as well. And I had a high fever as well. But I knew that, uh, no, I need to go straight to Middlemore, not to any clinic. With the country under level four, Tofinger is not allowed to enter the hospital with his wife. They took me straight away to get tested for my oxygen limb. I remember that I was missing him as well because I didn't say goodbye. And after that, they took me straight away to ICU and was sedated. It's not looking good for Lillian and the doctors are ready for the worst. Just prepare for a call from them to come and, you know, say goodbye, goodbye to, to her. It could have killed you, this virus. You were close. Mm. It was close, mm, so close. I have strong faith and believe in God. He will take off this virus from me. After two weeks, Lillian is woken up from her induced coma in time to hear the good news the Prime Minister has for the country. We have done what very few countries have been able to do. We have stopped a wave of devastation. In short, the effort of our team of five million has broken the chain of transmission and taken a quantum leap forward in our goal to eliminate the virus. On that basis, New Zealand will move out of Alert Level 4 lockdown. Stay strong, stay home, be kind, and let's finish what we started. Five weeks since he last saw Lillian, Tofinger is allowed to visit. So I just rush down and grab her, hold her, and kiss her. It's just like uh, another new chapter for us. The love for one another, it's so amazing. With lockdown bringing control over the virus, the country moves to level two. Currently, there is nobody in hospital with COVID-19 following the discharge of a person from Middlemore Hospital. It has been a two-month battle for Lillian and two and a half months for the country. Then on June the 8th, a few days later, we get the news we have all been waiting for. Did your immediate reaction when you heard there were no active cases of COVID-19 remaining in New Zealand? Um, I, I did a little dance. <laughs> That night, we went to level one. I've had questions from friends overseas, you know, how is it that New Zealanders did what was asked of them? Are you a really compliant group of people? Uh, not in my experience, necessarily. The thing that I'm so thrilled about is the extent to which New Zealanders lent in on this, where people actually voluntarily put huge restrictions on their own lives, knowing that it may not be of benefit to them, but it would be a benefit to their community and to the nation as a whole. And look what we've achieved. Yeah, I mean, who are the heroes here? Well, New Zealander of the Year is New Zealand, you know, actually. And in June, while New Zealand cautiously celebrates a new kind of normality, around the world, the virus rages on. In the US, California issued a mandatory stay-at-home order six days before New Zealand. But the state now has the most cases in the US and five months on, things have still not returned to normal. So this is our street during COVID times. There's uh, not a lot going on. Wherever we go, we have to have our masks on now. Kiwi couple Karen and Peter moved to the States on student visas back in 1993 and made a life there, bringing up their four kids in Los Angeles. But the COVID threat has changed everything. Peter has a serious autoimmune disease and catching the virus could be life-threatening. I mean, we count it as a good day when, when there are less than 20 people dying of COVID just in our county. 
Whoa. and you just don't see any end in sight. So it gets harder and harder and harder to think of a reason to get up in the morning. So with all of that upon them, Karen, Peter and the family have decided to return to New Zealand. I meet the family halfway through their two weeks quarantine on arrival. Their first of two COVID-19 tests has come back yeah. negative. Welcome back to New Zealand. Welcome home. Thank you. Yeah. How good does it feel to be back? Oh man, I mean, it's home, right? I mean, I know that we've lived overseas for a long time, but this is our home. This is, this is where our family is. This is where our culture is. This is where, this is where we are on the inside. Most people don't get this opportunity. We are so thankful. Just honestly, totally grateful for this. I'm very excited to live an actual life. How long will these hotel quarantines go on? Is this the new normal? I'm worried that this is how it's going to be for a long time. It seems like it could be for a while, doesn't it? After two weeks of quarantine, Karen, Peter and the family, COVID free, are at last out. But just 12 hours later, 102 days since elimination, COVID-19 was back in the community. We have come too far to go backwards. We know what to do because we've successfully done it before. Auckland is ordered back into level three lockdown and is isolated from the rest of the country who moved to level two. The government is spending $37 million to help find the vaccine. The mission is urgent and our top virologists, some of the best in the world, are working with scientists around the globe. Having a vaccine is the holy grail, of course. That's what everybody wants. It is the holiest it's, of grails. But, it's it's but everything. It's, but it's not that easy. I think we should be uh, thinking more along the lines of two years or a little longer. To put that in perspective, that would be an exceptional effort. Most vaccines take more like 10 to 15 years. An effective vaccine is the safest way to develop herd immunity where most of the population is immunised and the spread of the disease is constrained. The only other way is to let the virus spread. Herd immunity might be achieved when around 70% of people have caught the disease. But no one knows if having recovered from the virus offers long-term immunity yet. And while most people will experience mild symptoms, it would have a devastating effect for the rest as the health system becomes overwhelmed. At present, less than 2% of Americans have had the virus and there have already been 175,000 deaths. And that's why New Zealand chose elimination. Going down the herd immunity route, there's a lot of pain and anguish that would need to be gone through. We are fortunate in New Zealand in that we uh, have given ourselves a choice. I think the only choice is to, to keep the virus out and to, to, to wait on uh, effective vaccine or effective antivirals. That's the only way. That's the only way for now. Yeah. Until we find something. Until that vaccine comes, we're always going to be worried, aren't we? You're always going to be worried. We'll have to keep learning as we go and we'll have to keep um, making sure we're making good decisions. We need that vaccine though, don't we? Well, uh, we do need a vaccine, but in the meantime, we've got to adapt. We've got to get used to this new reality. The first lockdown was rough on New Zealand. It was a blunt tool, even deemed unlawful for the first nine days, but it worked. We eliminated the virus for 102 days. It gave us an breathing space to set up all these capabilities we just didn't have. And I think we've used that time well, but we're not in the clear. I mean, I think this is the first battle won in what will be a long-term campaign. A lot of things have to go right. You know, it's a tough virus to keep out. Elimination was an impressive first step in the fight against COVID-19. Thousands of lives were saved. And as a country, we're definitely more prepared to fight coming outbreaks. But a big wave today would still overwhelm the health system. And our hard border is far from tight. The reality is the enemy could strike at any time. Antiviral drugs could make it less lethal and rapid testing could slow the spread, but they aren't ready, so we can't let it loose. Can the country take any more lockdowns? How long can we live like this? Elimination is our best choice. At this moment, there is no better option.
In the University of Otago's high containment lab, work is being carried out to find a vaccine, the very thing that could end all lockdowns and finally defeat COVID-19. It's right there. Right there. Feels weird. <laughs> I guess what everybody wants to know is, have you made a breakthrough in there today? Uh, nothing, nothing novel today, unfortunately. But yeah, so, just keep yeah, that so. locked up and keep working on that vaccine, okay, pal? We will, we will. <laughs>